that around? Are you guys seeing the full screen? Nope, looks good from here. Okay, great. Well, again, I, I just want to say uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where this broadcast finds you. It's, it's great to have you all here with us for our um, virtual native storytelling hour with our guest storyteller returning uh, for his uh, second session with us. Uh, Mr. Robert Begay is, is here uh, broadcasting from, uh, from somewhere in Arizona. Is that, is that right, Robert? Uh, It's in New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico, yes. I, 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 you mentioned Flagstaff earlier, and I, I kept uh, thinking perhaps you were in, in, in uh, Arizona. But so R Robert is joining us uh, from New Mexico, um, and uh, we'll we'll be hearing from him in a few moments. Uh, just wanted to uh, take a few minutes to go over a few bits of information before we get started, and then I will turn the floor over to, to Robert. And my, my uh, Zoom continues to act a little strange. So we're just trying to, trying to uh, um, handle the technology the best I can. <clears throat> but I do want to welcome everyone. And it's great to see you, uh, see you all here with us today. Let's watch to, um, let's see. That's great. OK. So welcome to the Virtual Native Storytelling Hour. Uh, again, I'm, I'm honored to be here with all of you. I want to thank you for joining us uh, for our ongoing Virtual Native Storytelling series. Uh, most of you know, my name is Steve Steine. I'm one of the program managers here at the National American Indian Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center funded by SAMHSA. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that the content of today's broadcast is created by the presenter. Uh, it does not necessarily represent or reflect the views uh, of Santa or the National American Indian Alaska Native ATTC. Not sure who has their, their mic open, but if you would please mute uh, your mic, that would be great. <clears throat> Our next storytelling hour, just to, so you can kind of mark this on your calendars, and we'll certainly send out a reminder. Uh, but our next storytelling event will be held uh, Tuesday, July 14th at 2 p.m. Central. And uh, Robert Begay will uh, join us again for uh, the July uh, Native Storytelling Hour. I hope you can join us as well. Uh, you will see a couple of uh, links that I will place in the chat box uh, today. One is a short survey. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a, a short survey to help continue to provide events like this with our funder. And the other one is just a short independent um, uh, survey regarding feedback and your satisfaction of the event today. Uh, or if you've been attending the storytelling events and have already filled out the satisfaction survey, you don't need to do that again. But if you're new to the event, uh, please fill out the uh, both surveys, they only take a few minutes, and we really appreciate your feedback. Again, this event is brought to you by the National American Indian Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center, which is located at the University of Iowa. We are part of a national ATTC network across the United States. This project is supported and funded by SAMHSA. And as I said, the content of this uh, presentation uh, does not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA, HHS, or our center. <clears throat> Following today's event, as I referenced, we will send out um, uh, a follow-up email, which will include links to today's presentation, uh, as well as uh, a link to complete the uh, GIPRA survey and the satisfaction survey. <clears throat> we um, we are not uh, offering CEUs for this event, but uh, for other events, you can request CEUs. Uh, as I said, we will send out an email uh, following today's event. If you don't get a chance to fill out the survey today, you can do that via email. And we'll also make available um, copies of any slides if Robert is comfortable sharing those with the group. 
Um, and then we are recording this event as well, so it can be accessed through our HPC YouTube uh, archive webpage. <coughs> So again, oh. with, with the surveys, you know, please take a few minutes to fill those out. You can skip any questions that you're not comfortable uh, answering. And um, these surveys are completely confidential and not linked to you uh, in any way. Uh, please reach out to myself or uh, Abby or any one of us here at the center if you have any questions about the survey. I know we're gathered here virtually today, but I wanted to take uh, the time to acknowledge the, the land and pay respects to the indigenous nations whose homelands were forcibly taken and inhabited. Please take a moment to read this land acknowledgement, which was created by three members of our team, Ella and Keely Driscoll and Sean Bear. Thank you. So once again, I'm very honored to introduce uh, Mr. Robert Begay, our featured storyteller for today's event. <clears throat> Mr. Begay will be facilitating our sessions for the next, uh, this month and next month. And today we'll be telling um, the story, uh, we'll be telling uh, his second story uh, in this series regarding uh, I believe today the story is uh, uh, Navajo clan origins and histories. So we're really happy to have him here. Uh, Mr. VA is uh, Navajo uh, and his clan is near to water people. Um, <clears throat> I've just gotten to know him. He is part of our advisory uh, council. Uh, and so I've, I've known of him, but we're just getting to know one another. I'm really, really pleased to have him uh, join us today and uh, I want to turn the floor over to him. But before we do that, <clears throat> I've asked uh, Jim Weichel uh, here in the audience to uh, begin today's meeting with uh, a blessing. So I'll turn the floor over to Jim, and then Robert has the floor for the, for the rest of the event. Thank you. Skenos Wabwego Pinoxco. Hanono Gohais Nigazo. Otiyoni ni waga shouti, anatuaga ni ne ni ne. Kai gahono ni ganuiga ni wakunse day. Greetings, all my relatives. Um, I just introduced myself in our way. I I told you who I am, my name, my clan, which is the Wolf, my nation, which is the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma, and. Um, that was in the Cayuga language, just what we speak there. And um, my English name is Jim. I am uh, currently in Vancouver, Washington, residing on the uh, lands of the uh, Klickitat and the Chinookian speaking peoples. I'm going to give a real short version of our Ganohan Yoke, uh, the Thanksgiving speech. So, um, once again, Niawaskeno, Swagwego, Swariho Sios, Nihaiwaka, the Twitter Nahon Yone and Guesawa, the Twitter Nahon Yone, the Tiso also a Wednesday, the Twitter Nahon Yone, Haduana Ragre, Ono Guatrini, the Twitter Nahon Yone, Wayanita, the Twitter Nahon Yone. Oriharoni, the Twitter Nahonioni, Gadino, the Twitter Nahonioni, Onakaka Onio, the Twitter Nahonioni, Ganheko, the Twitter Nahonioni, the Wawenye, the Atinia Honioni, Ne Tiso Adwanadagis, the Twitter Nahonioni, said Weja Adika Gagwakis, the Atinia Honioni, the Tiso Asoheka Anidagis, the Atinia Honioni, Ojisa de Sia. The Atinia Honyo Ning and I got a gay had a hoya gahono. This one on the Honyo Ne Sangoidiso Danato Nagat Goni Agi Agai Gadak Ganohonyo Danato and Yahweh.
Yahweh Jim, I appreciate that. Uh, Yahweh Jim, I appreciate that. I'm going to uh, get Jim Sly or Robert slides up for his presentation. Uh, Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Begay. I am Janae Navajo, Tohan Shlon Tobah Bashichinke, Ani Dashiche, Kachide Dashinale. As uh, <clears throat> Steve had mentioned in the opening slide, and my, my, my clans are near the water people. That's who I am myself. That's my clan. I am born for the edge of water people. Um, then I am my maternal grandparents are the Towering House people. Yeah. And um, my paternal are the Red Streak running into the water people. Um, so today is really to talk about clan origins and stuff like that. So if we can move forward with it, uh, Steve. So again, Navajo clan origins. I, I'm really interested in um, one of the things that I really focused on when I was when I was in graduate school was really clan origins and how indigenous peoples relate to each other that are outside. But this is one of my um, my my things that I've studied quite a bit, not, not for academic reasons, but really for um, trying to understand how clans fit into Navajo world, Navajo origins and so forth. So um, next slide. technical issues here with this Zoom. It's been giving me trouble all day. There we go. So one of the things like, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure all native people have this and indigenous people across the world is their relationship with the universe and also the ecosystem. Again, on Navajo and, and within Navajo, eh is, eh is what we call the relationship. It really identifies the kinship, not only among we as Navajo people, but among um, our relationship to the whole universe and to the ecosystems and so forth. This day, this information is really losing its place in, in Navajo. And, and I will talk a little bit about it when it does come up. Um, at places, and it, what it means is kinship and the way Navajos think about this is eh, places in Navajo, not only the individual, but their proper place and relationship to everything in the Navajo world. And that includes the ecosystem, the universe, and so forth. It is basically one of the core values of Navajo culture, Navajo world. But it also does more than just putting people in a proper place, but it also gives them guidance on how to treat not only their per, per, personal relationship, but their relationships to the whole world and to the universe and even to non-Navajos. So in doing so, they use clanship um, as, as a system to move forward. Um, but every clan, there's in Navajo, there's quite a few clans and how clans, clans basically tells them where they belong within that, um, that natural world and also in that um, within the among the Navajo people, how do they relate to each other? And it also gives guides on this. But if you look at, and this is really, really one of the things that clans really have specific origins. Now among Navajo today, a lot of these clans, you know, you hear it all the time, you have Navajos introduce themselves. But that's what they were told. There's very few, and it, it's actually dying out. If you ask a specific Navajo, where does your clan come from? And where, what's the origins of it? Some may know, but a lot of them just say, that's what we've been called on this. Uh, or this is what I've been told. This is the clan that I am. But really have no background um, of where these uh, clans came from. And it, it's very important because today uh, we're losing that over and over and over. And 
Um, it's unfortunate. My father was really an advocate of, of, of plan, planship. Next, Steve. So before we really talk about Navajo clans, I want to talk about Navajos and, and how it is in anthropology, they call it matrilineal society. You know, I, I guess that's a fancy word, but in Navajo, everything is passed on through now through the female or the, the woman. My last presentation was about the role of uh, Navajo women in Navajo, in Navajo world. And I talked a little bit about changing the woman who is the mother of all Navajos. Today, that is also the matrilineal society today. So all things are handed through Navajo women, which includes clans. So I say that for one reason. Um, despite what the common belief is, Navajo women are really the leaders of Navajo people. They're not being on the forefront. They're not in the, you know, in the limelight, but they're the ones that have the leadership role. And the men really is the one that carries out that leadership, uh, that leadership. But the, the person behind the man is actually the woman. So today in clans, there is, there is some documents that says that there are an estimate of 65 to, well, actually, there are some documentation that says 65 clans, now with clans today. But from my research, is there's over 100 different clans. And how did this come to be? Well, there's a process in how clans are created. But before we really talk about the process of this, I want to talk about there are four clans to each Navajo individual. One is self. That's the one like for me. I am the Tohane or the near the water people. That's my first clan. And it's carried on from my, from my mother's side. Now, the father's clan is really who we're born for. I am born for my father's clan. Who is the edge of water people? And this is only carried through two generations. So my kids, their kids will not have my father's clan in any of the four original and the four individual clans. So my clan really disappears after my kids, after two generations. My maternal grandparents, who in my case is really Kiaani, the towering house people, that clan will disappear um, they don't appear in my um, in my children. Now, paternal grandparents and their clan only goes one generation too. So my kids um, do not have my maternal or my paternal grandparents' clans anywhere in their in their um, um, clan system. Next, Steve. All right. So I presented this, so, so we now understand where clans generally come from, but this is a chronology of Navajo origins. This is a generic, I mean, it all depends. It's a generic chart of Navajo origins. But as you look through this whole um, chart, um, and there's different reasons why, the, um, um, like I said, let me skip back. This is really a generic, Navajo origins flowchart. But if you talk to other people, there are certain things that um, are, they vary. And it also varies depending on what ceremonies you learn or what history you learn forth, so forth. But this is really a generic um, a Navajo origins chronology. But if you look down to the middle on the bottom of it, you see that blue aerial, that blue area, that, that blue arrow. Well, this is where changing woman creates the four original clans. Well, when changing woman went uh, to the West and where the sun bear, her husband built her house, the Navajo people missed her and they went to see changing woman. Changing woman basically said, the mother of all Navajo said, this is not your place here in the Pacific Ocean. You need to go back to the, your um, lands back in the, uh, between the four sacred mountains. So she sent them back. But before she sent them back, she remade them. 
And she remade the people out of her body, uh, rubbing skin off of her, I guess, remaking them. And, and basically, that's all she did. And basically, when they travel back, they did certain things. And we'll talk a little bit about this and how clans got their names. Okay, next, Steve. I'm trying to kind of go through this a little bit faster. I didn't test how long this is, but how, how clans are created. Again, we kind of talked about this. Um, how clans are created in Navajo. There are older clans than the one that were, when Changing Woman created them, there are older clans than, um, um, even older than the four original clans. Um, so basically that's how the older clans are. Then there are the four original clans that were created by Changing Woman, the Mother Wild Navajos, when they travel back to the four sacred mounds. Then there's another way that clans are created. Um, that, at least from my perspective, is how they were um, created. And that's really the adoption of plans. This is very important in it, um, the adoption of plans. Um, I, I think it's really important for today's society. I will tell you why at the end of the uh, presentation. Let's go forward, Steve. Um, Steve, let me let me go back one 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 slide back. This picture, no, no, next one. The next picture. This next picture has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different main clans, seven different plans. The first, the first clans, there are seven different clans that are represented in this picture. And this is the reason why I picked this, but I'll talk a little bit about it. Next, Steve. And, then, and this is all one family. So the four original clans, Changing Women recreated in Navajo, recreated um, or created the four original clans. One is Kia'ani, the towering house. One is Shlishti, the mud clan. And the other one's Tudichini, Bitter Water Clan, and Tohane, near the water people. There are people that say that the fourth one, Tohane, is really Honogani. But the way they didn't have names at the time they were created. So Changing Woman recreated her kids. However, she did not give them names. So what happens is on the way back from their track from the um, Pacific Ocean, back to the four sacred mountains, they were given um, gish, I, I don't know how to say gish in English, um, uh, canes, okay, canes. So what happened is on their way back, they asked the first group, say, hey, we're thirsty, dig, dig out some water, so they used their cane. Well, Kiani, the towering house people were the first people to dig for water, and they didn't find anything. They, they did not find any water. So what they did with the cane is they just leaned it against a, um, an archaeological site, um, a, a structure. And this is where they just had Kia'ani. It was a towering house. This is how they got their name. Now they went to the next group and they said, hey, we're hungry, we're thirsty. See if you can find some water for us. So they used their cane and they tried to dig for water. And they actually just did not find any water. All they found was mud. This is how they got their name, their mud clan, Hashkishni. So they couldn't drink water. So they asked the next group. So the next group basically dug for water and they did find water. However, it was really bitter water and you could not drink it. So they lived, So they asked the next group of people, that uh, the fourth clan, and they said, look, can you dig for water? So they did. And here, even though it says, the English translation says um, near the water, but um, is not really near the water. Near the water or means water that's really small. It means very little water that was like in a puddle. And this is how they got their name. So to talk about how the four original clans or any clan 
is really most clans got their names by their origins and their activities and how they did certain things. And this is how they got their names, at least the four original clans. Again, a lot of this stuff really comes from my mother, my late mother and my late father. And again, this is the, the, the stories that, or the history I have been taught um, in the, in, through my life. Next, Steve. So we talked about the four original clans. They were created by changing women, but there are older clans than the four original clans. The clans like before the, before the four original clans, like one is Tenjikin, the cliff dweller clans. Really, their origin really talks about, depending on who you ask, that has a Tenjikin clan, the cliff dweller clan, depending on who you ask, um, they will tell you, they come from White House in Canyon de Chez. Canyon de Chez, there's a big monument down there. There's a big um, cliff dwelling. It's, a, it's, it's one of the major um, sites on the reservation. And they said that that's where we came from. Our clan, our people come from that area. But there's also other people in western um, of the western part of the reservation where they said they come from the little Colorado River canyon there is a place down near the confluence of the big colorado river and the little colorado river there is an archaeological site there that the tenjikini clans that they originated from there so really these clans are actually older there are a few other ones that are older than um, the four original clans but this is the one that just came on the top of my mind this morning next steve Okay, so created by renaming them. Now, this is the this is the, the one that's really really interesting. The, these clans really come out from the actions of the same four. So we have the four original clans, but the four original clans have relatives, or they're they're, they're the same people, but they were renamed. So let's, uh, let me take, for example, um, go back, what's going on here. But in any case, let me take Tohane. Uh, Steve, I, I don't know what's going on here. But in any case, let's take Tohane, my clan. Now, my clan, Tohane, what's up? We're fine. I'm just continuing to have some issues with the Zoom here. We're fine. Okay. Can you go to the, the slide down there by renaming the the four original clans or renaming clans? Well, when you talk, no, it's the, let's see, one, two, I think it's like the ninth one. Okay, well, so I gotta go forward? Yeah, go forward. Well, while you're trying to find this out, let, so let me talk about Tohane. Tohane or all clans have really land lands that um, um, clans that are closely related to one clan. So in the case of Tohane, we have a set of clans, a clan group that are related to Tohane. So how did that come to be? From my understanding, from my father and my mother, my late mother and father, they said, it's the same people, but they were just given different names. And they were given give different names because of their actions. So let's say Tohane. There were two sisters that were Tohane, the same clan. But the younger sister, one day they were sitting there together and they were um, having, um, doing some activities, some traditional activities, um, activities. But the younger sister got up and walked around the older sister clockwise. Clockwise, uh, you're going backwards. Need to go forward. So um, keep going, and I'll tell you when to stop. So she got up. The younger sister got up. And walked with her bigger sister, her older sister. The older sister looked at her younger. Here, you're right there, boss. Um, the back one before. One slide back, Steve. So the younger sister got up, walked around the older sister, and the older sister looked at her younger sister and says, you know what? 
From here on out, you are going to be known as Hunagani, the clan that walks around. So that's how Hunagani got the name. Again, it was by an activity, and, and by her activity, there was a new name for that same clan. But again, that's one of the things. The other one is that Kadesh Zani. Again, this is Tohane, the same clan, the same people, and the same clan name, but a group of them moved among the trees. So the core group of the Tohane says, those guys over there are now what we'll call them as the people that live among the trees. And they were renamed Katnes Zahni. So again, again, a lot of the original clans were renamed because of their activity or they did some. That's why we have like from four to four original clans to 60 to 100, 100 plus clans. Again, it's just some one of those things that we talk about, or at least I think how we have so many clans today. Next. Steve, next slide. So again, by renaming. Now, this is the one that I really, really like. Again, adoption of new clans. Adoption of new clans is one subject that I think really is one of the things that um, is very important today. Because 150 years ago, there was probably around 10,000 Navajos. Today, we have 400,000 Navajos. And each one of those Navajos has specific clans. But there's a process and how clans are created. The adoption of clans are, were very important. Again, remember that um, clans are very, tells you where you belong in the universe and among the same people that you, uh, among, among Navajo people. But it also places you in a proper place within the ecosystem in the universe. So let's talk about this. Remember, let me just recap this. The matrilineal society, clans are handed down through the mother or the female or the woman, okay? So they're the ones that never changes. So if, um, your clan, your first clan always comes from the female side. Now on the non-Navajo, Navajo, Navajo uh, so this is just some for my notes. There are clans today that have been adopted, but how does that happen? In the olden days, when Navajos were a smaller group and they had non-Navajos or enemies, or we call them enemies, like the Hopi people, the Zuni, the Utes, all those guys were non-Navajos and we referred to them as Naj, they were enemies in a sense. And what happened was through warfare and also through uh, raiding, they, they would gather um, slaves. And for some reason, this slide is, I don't think it's in the right place. But in any case, let me just explain. So back in the old days, and this is actually from an interview, or several interviews on this, is um, what happened was two girls or at least a girl were, was enslaved by Navajo people. That non-Navajo girl eventually got married to a Navajo man. And from that Navajo man became children. But remember the clan of the, Nav the non-Navajo woman is the clan that Navajos keep. Remember, clans come through matrilineal. So the father and mother, it's their kids. This is the human part of Navajo people. The kids of that non-Navajo mother, but the Navajo father were the kids. And they recognized there, there are kids. But their clan was alien to Navajo people. Not alien, but they knew who they were. But it was kind of an odd way to address um, those kids outside the immediate family, outside the mother and father. Um, and it, and it comes unnatural. I mean, you don't want to tell your own kids that you're not Navajo. So how do we address this issue? 
So what happened was, at least from my perspective and in the interviews that I did with my dad and some of the people that I know is really, how did that, um, how do we adopt plans? So to make a non-Navajo child, that a non-Navajo plan child, Navajo is a process. And basically what they did, at least from my father says, you basically said, yes, there is a whole process to this. And I use Nanastasia Kabahe is that the father, they take the father's plan here in this case is Nanastasia Kabahe. Next slide, Steve, it's actually gonna talk about this a little bit more. The, they take the plan of the father, for an example, Nanestesia Kabai is what we call the Zuni branch of the Edge of Water clan. So the Edge of Water clan is a Navajo clan, but the Zuni branch is really um, the mother's um, clan or her origin. She came from the Zuni. In this case, the, 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 there were two Zuni girls that were enslaved by Navajo and they were taken from a Zuni cornfield. One of the Zuni girls got married to the Navajo male and child, and then to a Navajo man and had children. The children carried their mother's origins. So they're really Zuni people, and they're still considered non Navajo traditionally. Remember, this is all traditional. However, born for a Navajo person, a Navajo male, which is Tabahe. So this is really some that is not comfortable. Even the parents and the grandparents knew this. And they kind of thought, well, this is not really in line of how we should greet our own children because they have a Navajo father, even though the mother is not Navajo. So they kind of figured this out and they said, and it wasn't like figuring it out. It was really a process. And they said, well, to accept these kids fully as Navajo, we need to figure out some. But it was a process that, I don't think they intentionally figured this out. It just happened naturally, is to place the Navajo kids, the non-Navajo kids born for Navajo in Navajo world. So what they did is basically, um, the parents accepted them as a child, but they also, uh, um, the grandparents accept the non-Navajo children but with a Navajo father and accepts them as their children, as their grandchildren. And then they, this also happened to the extended family, then to the community. But the problem was how do we, how do we, how do Navajos greet them or what is their identity as a clanship? So what happened was that they took the father's clan and then they added the Navajo name for Zuni. So they call it the Zuni branch of the Edge of Water clan. So that became the name of that clan. So the young lady's kids, or those two kids, or whatever kids, it doesn't matter. Those kids now have a new clan, a new clan with a name called the Zuni branch of Edge of Water clan. And this is really an, an effort to really give Navajo kids, or at least the ones that were adopted, a place within Navajo world and their proper place as Navajos. It is us, or it was up to the parents and up to the grandparents to ensure that our children, our great-grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren had a place in how we relate to each other, not only to each other, but to accept it as our own and accept it among our, our Navajo world, Navajo culture. Again, this is really a brief description on how clans are. In the olden days, most of the adoptions or the new clans that were created or renamed or created was really through road uh, warfare, um, you know, slavery and stuff like that, but also through marriages between Navajo people and non-Navajo people. Next. Uh, just one more comment. This is easier done back in the day because of the less, the less, there's not, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Navajos 
Today, we have 400,000 Navajos, according to the last census count that the federal government got. Now, back then, it was probably around 10,000 10, people. And it's easier in smaller groups to, um, to accept these new names and new clans. Today, it's, it will be harder. Remember, going back to eh, eh, is very important to Navajo people. It is the core value that puts order to Navajo world and Navajo people. This relationship, again, goes beyond not just among our five-fingered brothers and sisters, but this is also extends to the universe, to the world, to everything that grows on the earth and to the ecosystem. It is very, very important. Like eh, and clanship is where we come up with. And, and, it, and it is very, and it's one of those things that we have to be, or at least now the whole culture realizes that you must know your place in the world. But you also need to know your place among the uh, people for not only good health, but good behavioral health, mental health, and it's also very, very, a place that you belong to. You don't, you are a child of our holy people. And this is one of the main, main things that I think we're missing today is that I see this every day in Gallup. I see young Navajos, both female and male, and then even older ones that are walking along the streets. And someone in, in the last two years, you see, which I've never seen in the five years I've been going to Gallup for my job is now today, this year and last year, you see Navajo people that are out on the streets that say homeless. Um, they have signs and we're homeless. We need money and so forth. And I, you know, it's, it's some that I just, I don't know why, but it really, really tugs at my heart that my, our people, my people are resorting to stuff like this. And it is not true. It's probably because they've had a hard life. Um, and every reservation does this. I mean, every reservation has the poverty that the Navajo Nation has. But it really tugs at my heart when I see that. And I always wonder, do they, were they ever taught eh, or kinship or clans? Because from my perspective, there should be no Navajo that says they're homeless. They have a home within the four sacred mounds. They have Mother Earth. They have Father Sky and all the living beings in between them. And they should never be homeless. And I understand the behavioral issues, the mental issues on this. But again, it, it, it does tug at me. And it's some that I think we should continue to reinforce among our younger children. We do these things, at least from my teachings of my father, my mentors, my my older brother is that, you know, we plan not for the generation now, but we plan for seven generations ahead of us. And we want our people to be surviving in seven generations, not surviving, but having a good life in seven generations down the road. So again, with that, thank you for asking me to present this. It's very important. And I'm pretty sure that all native peoples and all Aboriginal peoples and indigenous peoples have the same issues we do have, but it is some that, or at least the people that I have contacted among this group is that the survival of indigenous people is very important. And is what separates us from non-indigenous people or non-native peoples. But in any case, all human beings, we are all five finger people, despite our skin, our skin color. We have a duty to become good human beings. And again, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Robert. Again, I want to apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, seems to have stabilized here, but I want to open the floor. We have uh, we have about ten minutes or so before the top of the hour, and uh, 
want to thank everyone for listening and being part of this uh, event. But I want to open the floor now to questions for Robert, comments, thoughts, feelings related to what's been shared. I guess I had a question. Um, I see Akuni. I'm Athabascan and Lakota, um, and I was raised Athabascan. Um, but I, my desire for Lakota culture is is there, um, and I get to attend my first Pine Ridge powwow this summer, and I'm so excited. And I'm going to King Brown concert also, so I'm I'm really excited for July. Um, I work with um, our youth here in Fairbanks, and so I really know that it's important to for them to know where they come from and stuff. But um, <clears throat> my question to you would be, what's your belief about like how cultures or whatever, they have their corporations or whatever, and the take on um, blood quantum? Um, because... Um, I know that a lot of kids I know, they're half black, half native, half white, half native, or vice versa. And so our corporations are denying them sometimes membership. So it's just something that weighs on my heart because I think is it's just only going to dilute more over time. So um, where this fits in in life and stuff. So that was my question. So I, I, that's a great question. I mean, and, and one of the things is, let's let's separate this really quickly. Is that corporations, or at least that's a federal and a state policies and procedure. But from a real traditional perspective, at least on Navajo, you are. Blood quantum is a big debate among Navajos, and I understand why, because, you know, there are benefits that go along with it, and I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, but from a traditional perspective, is really what we think, how do we hold up the idea of what holy people, or at least Navajo holy people do? How do they greet us as their children, their grandchildren? And it has nothing to do with blood quantum. It has to do with five fingers. We are the children of holy people. Maybe Lakota, or maybe Navajo, or maybe you. We are children of the holy people. They're own holy people. But again, I, I don't have an answer for benefits that come out of court uh, for Navajo people that, or for indigenous people that are based on blood quantum. That is a big debate, debate on that. Uh, okay. And then I had one more question. It's kind of really off the wall, but I know that I've, I've been on these before, but I've been away for a while because I work for the school. Um, my friend gave me this pot. It's, she called it a worry pot. And I wanted to know the, um, the background of it. It's made out of clay. Um, it's signed by a Corey guy, but I don't know, she said it was from that area and she went to school down in, um, Colorado, Durango, Colorado. I don't know if you know any history on Corey Potts. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, actually, um, pots and dishes are really an important part of, um, novel people, um, Again, I can tell you the specific things on this, but pots are really integrated in in naval ceremonies and stuff like that. There is a specific ceremony that mentions pots. Uh, we mm -hmm. call it the pots and pots, but it's really for non navajos But they're they're considered to some extent they they're alive. But in any case, um, I can tell you about that specifically on that. Okay, thank you. had a question come in on the, the chat, uh, Robert. Um, Verna asks, you mentioned older clans, but any older clans have come from the, I think it's the, the Chaco Canyon area. 
know if I'm saying that right. Yes, there is all the, the you know, there's the chocolate, tell me, I mean, I, there are plants that come from chocolate. Um, you know, if there are some extinct uh, plants like Ashina. Um, there are plants like uh, Maideskizni um, that come from that area. Um, so I, I have to kind of look at it, but there are older plants. Chocolate Canyon is one of the places that, um, and Mesa Verde, there are plants that come from Mesa Verde, from Chocolate Canyon, from Aztec ruins, um, places like that that are um, anywhere from six to several thousand years old um, um, occupations of the Southwest, plants that originate from there. Um, and then Chocolate Canyon is a big area that um, there's a whole history there about plants there. have time for a few more questions. Um, anybody has anything, feel free to unmute. Ask, ask a question to Robert or comment or thought or feeling. Well, we wait for another um, question. There are a lot of clans among Navajos, such as they have sub branches and so forth, like mm, the white corn, changing woman, towering house people. So there's like, you know, branches of those. There's also clans such as the Ute people, the Hopi people, the Zuni people, the salt clans, the Akama, the Lagunas. All those clans that are big that have become Navajo, but again, it's they go through the same process, or at least my perspective on this is they go through the same process to be to become Navajo clans and become part of Navajo people. Um, Utes, Apaches, we do have Apaches like um, what is it? Bahai, um, Chisha, Chisha is one of those. But in addition to plants, there are ceremonies that come that were are now ceremonies, but have closely close ties to other tribes in the traditional ceremonies. I wanted to take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, one of our uh, <clears throat> participants, Ray Daw, who is a advisory council member and a senior consultant of ours here at the center. And by the way, uh, Robert is also a, one of our advisory council members. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. Other questions, thoughts, or comments? Uh, Robert, one has come in on the chat. Uh, it's from Pamela. She says, uh, how are younger Navajo children learning the language to be able to articulate their clan and understand when others identify themselves as, as their clans? So this is a big, big issue. Um, I know other tribes around Navajo, a lot of them probably speak 10% of, or at least the younger generation speak um, 10% of them understand and speak their language. Among Navajo, I think it's more around 40% of younger Navajos learn to speak their Navajo, uh, their language. Um, how they introduce, a lot of the stuff that you see today is really, if you hear now young Navajos introduce themselves and speak Navajo, it's really rehearsed. And I'm not being critical on this. It's really rehearsed. This is how you identify yourselves. And they just kind of memorize it. But if you sit down and talk to them, you can't have a conversation with them. Um, it's just really memorized. But we always encourage and I always encourage them that you weren't born speaking Navajo. You learn English. Now you can learn English, um, Navajo. But again, there is there's some resurgence here and there. But again, it it's really extends from 
um, from the home. If you don't use it in alpha language, um, you're going to lose it. So even my kids, I mean, even though they're getting involved in the ceremonies that I perform or go to, they have some difficulties in expressing themselves um, and try to hold a conversation in Navajo. Um, I know at one point I made it, that I tried to speak to my kids. I was the only one to speak Navajo in, in, to them in Navajo all the time, 100%. And they would look at me really blankly like, what did you just say? And then they would ask my wife to translate what I just said to them. So they're, they're catching on it, but it does have to extend from their home to reinforce what they're learning in Navajo, in, the, in, in school. Well, we are at the top of the hour. I, I want to, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> really thank uh, Robert Begay for sharing with us this, this knowledge about Navajo uh, culture and history. Uh, I've learned a lot and uh, want to apologize again for some of the technical issues. Um, try and be a little better, better next time, Robert, I promise. And I uh, want to thank everyone again for attending and being part of this event. Uh, we will make this available uh, <clears throat> on our YouTube archive. If you weren't able to attend or have a colleague or a friend that you wanted to share this with, you can uh, do that. I will put uh, a couple of different links in the uh, chat box. If you can take a couple of minutes to fill out those uh, surveys, I, I would really appreciate that. Again, I want to thank Robert Begay for spending this hour with us and uh, sharing this information. So thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, um, everybody, for listening. I do want to apologize for um, a lot of this stuff I do in Navajo and trying to translate into English is very difficult. I'm thinking Navajo, but translating in English is really a task in itself. So again, thank you for but do reach out to us to, if you want some clarification. But again, I know a lot of the native tribes that are that are on, or the people that are representing tribes do have similar types of societies and stuff and clanships and stuff. But um, promote that, um, and for your for for the generations of our children and all native children. Thank you. We will broadcast again uh, July 14th at 2 p.m. Central. Uh, please join us if you can, and Robert will be sharing uh, more information and stories related to uh, the Navajo people. So uh, we are, uh, again, really grateful to have everyone here. If you can, fill out uh, the surveys. If you've already filled out the satisfaction survey, you don't need to do that a second time. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. Until next time, stay safe and stay healthy and stay connected.